I was so impressed by him. I was like, yo, I'm getting this album cover. You know, I'm going to figure out how to do that. I didn't really know he had an album coming when I shot the stress thing. But um, my friend uh, took a job as in the press department at Rockefeller Records. And her name was KB Payne. And uh, she said, look, he's got an album coming. Dame is about the cash. Biggs is a silent sort of investor. He's the engine and Jay's the talent. Like, act accordingly, bring your book, bring it this afternoon, and I'm going to get you a meeting, and I'm going to get you this cover. Yeah, yeah, check it out. I'm your host, Corey Cambridge. Uh, yeah. Everybody tuning in, you invited, you invited. No matter what mood you in, get excited, get excited. Everybody love the music, let me tell you how they do it. Whether writer or an agent, let me tell you how they made it. You are now talking to a silent giant. Wanna walk in their shoes, silent giants. Wanna study they move, silent giants. Wanna know what they do, silent giants. Silent giants, y'all. <laughs> Welcome to the Silent Giants Podcast, a podcast highlighting the superstars behind your favorite superstars in creative industries. I'm your host, Corey Cambridge. To keep up with the latest on the show, be sure to subscribe and follow us on Instagram at, at Silent Giants Podcast. To keep up with my life, music, and more, be sure to follow me as well on Instagram at, at Corey Cambridge. Today on the show, we have a very special guest, photographer Jonathan Mannion. Jonathan is responsible for some of the most recognizable images in hip-hop history, including album covers for DMX, Eminem, but most notably he's known for his iconic album covers with Jay-Z. To celebrate the release of Jay's new album, 444, we spoke with Jonathan to chat about his career as a photographer, meeting Jay-Z for the first time, and the story behind the photo shoot for Jay's debut classic album, Reasonable Doubt. So without further ado, let me introduce you guys to the legendary photographer, my friend, the silent giant, Jonathan Mannion. So, Mr. Jonathan Mannion, welcome to the yes, show. Sir. It's beautiful to be here. It, it's, it's, I don't even know, the show's called Silent Giants, but I don't even know if, if the word silent for you is even appropriate. You're just a giant that everyone knows. You, you're just, I, you're I so silent. Awesome. You've, you've I think eclipsed silent applies. the name Silent Giants, which is rare. You know, look, it's, it, but it's silent, though. Think about my medium. You know what I mean? You're looking at a still exactly. image, and you get to create your narrative around what it is. What are your thousand words for this image? It's different for everybody. But silently, I've delivered images that speak very loud. Absolutely. And so the, the story for you starts in Cleveland. I described yeah. your upbringing for me in Cleveland. What was that like? Oh, man. You know, Bay Village, Ohio. It's a small suburb of Cleveland. It's about 30 minutes outside of the city uh, on the west side. And... Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say it's, you know, it's suburban, suburban life, man. You know, I grew up, you know, cutting grass and snow blowing and raking leaves and, you know, kind of basic Ohio stuff, you know. Um, my dad is from Brooklyn. Okay. Um, so I, I definitely had, I didn't have the typical sort of Ohio family, you know what I mean? It's like my mother's from London, dad's from Brooklyn, you know, so there were trips to New York. So I got to feel kind of the pulse of the big city. And, uh, you know, I, I traveled probably 10,000 miles by the time I was one, just back and forth. It's definitely a place that I call home, you know? It's, uh, we would probably go uh, once a year, at least for the first maybe, t you know, 17, 18 years of my life, and we'd go for about two weeks to three weeks. Wow. You know, and so, like, it was definitely enough to get a vibe and, and, and really feel it out. All my family is still there, all my uncles and aunts and little baby cousins, and, you know, they're scattered. But, uh... Yeah, it was it was phenomenal to to have that to realize um, that in five hours you could change your whole world, you know. And I don't think a lot of people in Cleveland in the suburbs had that ability to kind of just shift and move and to have that international mindset while being sort of in the suburbs at the same time. There was a real fascination with with New York and and city and urban kind of vibes. Like where I went to high school uh, in Cleveland was Saint Ignatius High School, and uh, it was downtown, so it was like, you know, and a lot of my friends lived on the east side. I was on the west side, so, you know, there would be a lot of travel, like, right through the heart of the city. And I would always take the grimiest routes, you know what I mean? I always wanted to, like, pass by where I knew, like, the hookers would be on the thing or the, the Lancer Lounge, which is a super big pimp spot, just to see the cars <laughs> with the white walls. Like, I mean, it was just dope. It was just information, and, and I was fascinated by it as I related to hip hop and what I do. And I chased it. I believed in it. I wanted to be part of it. I knew 
my richest contribution was something visual. I knew that I couldn't rap. I knew that I didn't want to be a manager. You know, it's the very few roles that you understand as you enter this kind of arena. Like, okay, I can't do that and I can't do that, but you know, I can tell an amazing story and I can actually execute it. And my references are different than anybody else that's doing it because my parents are painters. I grew up going to museums. I looked at Renaissance paintings my whole life. Like I was, you know, really shown, you know, a great uh, in-depth look at art and through the ages to be able to really understand it. I thought I was going to be an art history major when I went to college, but instead I did psychology and studio art, you know? So, you know, like all of that has always been encouraged. And I think that that gave me the ability, um, you know, to, to really be, to execute what I wanted to do at the highest level with a base of understanding that come from, came from somewhere super real, you know? How'd you first get into photography? So, you know, it's, it, people have asked me this question before, like, when did you get your first camera? You know, that, that kind of thing. Was it like, you know, from birth and you've always been shooting? It's not really. I was more, I would more paint and draw, you know, and, but I was always encouraged to kind of examine things to look at the light, how it's falling, understand composition, because, you know, my dad is a painter, so he's talking me through everything as he's doing it, as I'm asking questions, and just fascinated by what he's able to create just out of his mind and put down on a, on a canvas, you know? Um, was there, was there so a magic moment for you? There, there was, you know, I was given a camera probably when I was maybe 14 or 15, you know, sort of the first thing, and I think they were trying to encourage, and it was a Minolta something. You know, and I like brought it to Aruba. We went on a family vacation. I think it was like one of the, a combo deal. Like we'll get him a camera and then he can document his moments and maybe he's interested in that. And I just really wasn't at that time. You know, I was like, eh, whatever. <laughs> I was like, I want to go scuba diving. I want to, you know, I want to snorkel. I want to go play soccer and tennis and yeah, anything that I was doing sort of in that moment. But um, it was really my final year at Kenyon College where I went. And uh, Go Shaka Smart. Shaka Smart. You know yeah. who Shaka Smart is? No. He, he was the uh, VCU Rams coach. Oh, wow. That won the Final Four Amazing. against Kansas, the biggest upset in college basketball history. My wow. school, VCU, all day. Wow. Yeah, he played for Kenyon. Amazing. You got to start there. Wow. There you I go. I did not know. Paul Learned Newman. New. Paul Newman, I did know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my final year, I picked up a camera, and I was like, you know, what an incredible way to have, you know, a moment with somebody, you know, to like, to document something that will never be the same again. But uh, yeah, that was it. I was like, this is, this is what I want to do. I was like, instantly, first roll of film. I was like, oh yeah, this is it. Like, because I really loved the selection process. I thought that like printing and developing was magic. You know, you stick a piece of paper and some chemicals and then these images show up. And it's like, <laughs> come on, do that again. That's magic. Yeah. You know, that really is magic to me. You know, like, I don't know how it happens. You know, it's science and shit. But, yeah. And so uh, how did you end up meeting and getting linked up with Richard Avedon here in New York. So Richard Avedon is arguably the Michael Jordan of photography. You know, if, you know, there's LeBrons, there's other people, there's amazing shooters. Like, you know, the art form is really rich and, and the depth of people creating um, that are making beautiful images and documenting it from their perspective is, is phenomenal, you know? But Avedon really revolutionized fashion photography. Um, he, uh, you know, made major contributions to the civil rights movement. Um, fashion was mainly his thing, but also like this psychological portrait, you know, the connection between a shooter and, and the subject and how he, you know, pulled out information, you know, or how he crafted and put his touch on what he wanted somebody to, um, to emote, you know what I mean? It's like that manipulation of character to get what he wanted as his final image. So the year that I graduated, uh, Kenyon gave Avedon an honorary degree because he employed three former students from Kenyon. So all three assistants that he had from various years prior um, were all Kenyon grads because he liked that we were well-rounded, well that we weren't just like photo nerds, that's all I do. We could have a conversation about politics or fashion or travel or whatever. He held a master class, you know, which basically judged the final project, the senior thesis of maybe 10 of the best students. I was one of them. And uh, he came to my work and he said, I see this body of work as a failure because there's no life in it. You know, it's like I was shooting barns, you know, and, you know, so I was like, all right, well, thank you so much for your critique. I think it would have crumbled a lesser man, somebody that hadn't had critiques and art critiques and my parents, you know, sort of like really 
encouraging me to really think deeply on layers, you know, deep. And I think I was like, you know, great, fantastic. And at the same time, his first assistant who had come back was looking at how I printed. So he was looking at what I shot and they were looking at my technical ability. And, and you know, certainly at that time, I was dedicating so much of my, my energy into really understanding it, spending time. I love the process of printing. So they were able to see that I had something else, that there was another gear that maybe the other students didn't have. Okay. Know? So I got an opportunity to interview directly out of school. I stayed after for about a, uh, a week to print a whole new portfolio of the best of what I had. And uh, went and had the interview. I didn't get the job at first because I needed somebody that was like a, a technical expert. Um, and I was not. I, I couldn't tell you the chemical makeup of Dectol. And, you know, I would like, I knew the basics, you know. But, uh, but they also saw my dedication that I handled art very well because I've been framing my dad's art my whole life. I knew how to carry art, move it, you know. And he was doing a show at the Whitney uh, retrospective. So... About two months later, I was in Chicago. I thought I was going to move to Chicago and sort of like learn the craft through a secondary market and just learn it and then maybe go to New York, you know, or figure out what I was going to do. And I got a call when I was there, like, pack as if you're going to live in New York and you have another interview and we're really excited to have you back. And, uh, you know, you're going to meet with, with, with Dick and, you know, if he likes you, it's on. And his, his first and only interview question was, tell me about your parents. And I was like, oh, wow. I love my parents. <laughs> <laughs> my parents are the shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yo, and, and literally he was like, yo, he's perfect. Yo, you're hired. You know, and, and then I became like, you know, the guy that they got to, to just shit on. You know, it's like, yo, go drive out and get, you know, $16 million worth of prints in 20 inches of snow in deep Jersey. And I was like, yep, gotcha. I got that. Like, I was so hungry and like really just wanted to contribute. I'm a great collaborator and and you know i learned that i was great support for any of the photographers that i worked for so abaddon was a year a year commitment i did my year um and you, and you came out to to new york i moved to new york yeah so tell me the story of, of moving to to new york well for the first like month that i was there i stayed with um at an ex-girlfriend spot she had a new boyfriend she's like i'm just gonna go stay with him you can stay here settle plant your feet you know, and then when you find a place, like, all good. So her name was Leslie. Amazing. Like, still grateful to this day. And I, I was down by um, 7th Avenue and 11th Street. So, like, I was in, you know, super swanky in a brownstone. Like, Are you living? Floor. I was living. Okay. I was balling. Okay. I was like, yo, I'm never living. <laughs> like, she better marry this boyfriend. <laughs> like, because I ain't, I'm squatter's rights, dog. That's <laughs> awesome. And, uh, and then my, um, one of my friends from Kenyan, was like, hey, we're gonna look for a place. It's gonna be three, three of us gonna get one place, and we got it on the Upper West End, uh, Upper West Side. It was Seventy Second and Riverside. And uh, I mean, yeah, you have a thing for locations, phenomenal. man. Yeah, location, location, location. Okay, man. okay. So, if, if photography, you know, you want to retire, there's always real estate for you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> man. I gotta think about that, man. Seventy Two and Riverside. Seventy Second and Riverside, right on the park. Damn. Yeah, it's the last building on Seventy Second. Yeah, the walk, the water, the, the wind off of the water, though, in the winter. Wind off of the water in the winter. Try and say yeah, that. Nice, nice alliteration there. Yeah, man. was like, oh, my God. It was awful. That was the only bad thing about that place. Um, but it was an amazing place. It became like total bachelor pad. You know, like we'd throw a bunch of parties. So we, were, we would all debate of who had the best job because my best friend, still not to this day, his name is Dan Lerner, um, he... Uh, managed and represented uh, opera singers through ICM. Wow. So his mother was a famous opera singer. His father played in the Pittsburgh Symphony. And, like, you know, he's just a phenomenal kid and so knowledgeable about it. So he was, like, kicking ass, right? And then the other one was dealing with a legal firm that dealt with importing and exporting of fine wines and alcohol. And then I was working for Avedon doing the photo thing. So, like, you know, we would sort of, like, join forces and just throw these like bender parties, man. Like literally you wake up the next morning, there's like an inch of red wine on the floor in the whole place. Because like we would get cases and cases and cases of wine. People were double fisting like $50 bottles of wine. <laughs> you know what I mean? And just having a ball. But the bucks at that time was at that like time. $130 bottle of wine. Yeah. Oh, y'all yeah. were living. Yeah, we were doing it, man. Damn. We, we, we had fun. And it's actually the same spot where I shot Reasonable Doubt on the roof of my building. I shot Joe's album. I think maybe it was called Everything. 
or All That I Am, maybe? Well, I think, I think My um, Name Is Joe. Was it My Name Is Joe? Not my name. Not the first one. The second one. Second one. Okay. That had yeah, stutter on like it. Sort of, that had stutter on it? No, I did that one too, though. That was the third one. Yeah, there was, I think it was, was Joe, one? Everything was the first album. Okay. I think All That I Am was the next one. It's like sort of moody, you know, sort of a sepia tone kind of cover. Okay. And then the, the next one was him in sort of some red mesh thing we shot in some loft down in soho it's phenomenal but and so so know. how did you uh how did you you working working under uh, richard avedon yeah how did hip-hop come into play in your in your medium of art yeah. as a photographer i mean I, I think it was constantly in play i mean that was my personal work like i didn't have a lot of personal time you know like the dedication to the avedon position was like seven in the morning till nine at night you know i was the first guy there bringing donuts and muffins and chopping them up and making sure the OJ was there. I was like the lowest, I was the lowest on the totem pole. So I did everything that anybody didn't want to do joyfully, you know? And then I would leave at nine at night because I was the guy taking out all the trash and moving around. But late at night I would go sit in, in the archive room and I would just look at images and just absorb the process, like how he did it, you know? So that was, you know, a huge gift and an amazing sort of opportunity. But at night, I'd go home and I'd have my slice of pizza. I was making $289 a week. And I would have a slice of pizza or whatever leftovers I took from the studio that like, were going to get thrown away. And, um, and I would eat and then I would go to the clubs. And so like, I was you know, at the Tunnel and I was at the Palladium and I was at Esso's and I was at you know, Latin Quarters. I was like everywhere, you know, just shooting, documenting, spending time. I felt like I needed to be seen twice as much as everybody else just because I was, you know, highest yellow from Cleveland, AKA a white boy, <laughs> you know, highest, highest, <laughs> highest yellow, <laughs> highest yellow. No oh relation to weed smoking. God, that's so no good. That's rep. hilarious. Highest yellow. So, so describe, describe the, the hip hop scene for me in New York at that time. I mean, oh, obviously, man, was, you know, you definitely st stood out. Uh, Wu-Tang. The highest of yellow. Nas. Biggie, Jay, you know, it's like right before, right before they had this incredible run. I mean, I just remember like Rakim performing. I remember Gangstar performing. You know, I befriended somehow like ODB's cousin. So I was in, you know, deep Brooklyn, late night, four in the morning, shootings happening. Like, I mean, it was just crazy, but I was just relentlessly chasing images you know and I, and I think really it was in the clubs that I got access because at that time you know it wasn't like cushy it wasn't like everybody these days you know they're like oh man I want to hang out with ASAP Rocky maybe I'll be a photographer I'll just pick up a camera I'll hang out with him we're friends and I'm around and I'm just gonna get the shots and then I'm gonna turn into a photographer it's like yo you had to know your craft we were shooting film you know like you really had to know what you were doing in order to deliver the images. And you had to have that instinct. Like there was no looking at the back of the camera to show somebody what we did. Like you knew it and then you had to deliver it quickly to the artists so they could have this moment or try and get in the source or vibe like behind the scenes. So like I was at every event just shooting, you know, like from Tyson Beckford to Ed Lover to like PMB Nation clothing, like ad campaigns, you know. So from these events, I got opportunities to do portraits, you know. So I was like, great. You know, I was getting free cameras and I was shooting it and assisting myself and lugging around all this stuff. Like there was no like one little digital camera and just like have a moment. Like you were there with lights to be prepared and lugging bags and you know, we were beasts, man. We would travel with like 13 to 15 cases. I'm sorry, was everywhere like, we like, went. Like the like DJ once, hustle. Once we really got into it. Yeah, it was like crates. Same thing, man. You know, it was just a totally different beast. So to have come up in that system, you know, it's like you definitely, anybody around that time, you know, really earned their stripes. The one that really put uh, the time and energy into that, you know, was, was phenomenal. So, you know, hip hop around that time, it was a lot of walking around. It was a lot of me with a backpack on you know, with my St. Ides hat that I got for free, you know, with a big crooked eye on the front, you know, wearing Stussy, probably, you know, Fila, Carl Kanai, you know, that was sort of the style and attire, you know, definitely some, you know, Nikes or Adidas or whatever it was at the time, probably Nikes, you know, but then once I started doing album covers, Reasonable Doubt was my first album cover, 96 for Jay-Z. And I've heard of that album. Once, yeah, he's, 
Well, he's an artist from Brooklyn. I don't know a lot of people. Local he's, rapper. He's a little unknown. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's doing well for himself, though, today, allegedly, I hear. Yeah, I, I think I haven't he's heard married. a lot. No, I don't, I don't know. I hadn't heard that. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. Yeah. So, he could be, though. You know what I mean? Like, Maybe. We'll be. see. I, yeah. I have this check on his Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> see if he's, see I think he's he still has an account. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I get in touch. That's how we <laughs> communicate is through Facebook. You know what I mean? Because how, how did you, uh, like, what were your, some of your first, like, publications? Did it start off first, like, into doing portraits, or was it you getting into magazines, like yeah. The Source, or? Yeah, it was really, um, you know, again, it was, like, the behind-the-scenes kind of stuff. I would show up and meet with a photo director of, like, The Source. A kid. It was actually an, an, another great shooter named Chimo Du. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he would look at the work and say, you know, this is cool, like, we'll probably take this one for like the in the mix page. And so like, you know, the images were being printed as big as postage stamps, you know? So, but, but that was a win. I was on, I'm on page 78 <laughs> with Lily from SWV and Ed Lover at the club. <laughs> like I got that. That's me dog. That name, butter credit. <laughs> I just pounded my chest by the way, <laughs> Cleveland thing. You know? Oh man. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was amazing. And then from that, you know, you would get an opportunity. But I really think that it was, I started working for the labels because I wanted to be attached to the music. You know, I don't want to say I didn't care about the publications, you know, but that was a month. Like, I want, I want to be attached to this thing forever, you know? So, like, you know, if you close your eyes right now and think of, like, Bob Marley Kaya, there's an image that comes up. You know, Coltrane, an image that pops up. You know, Jay-Z Reasonable Doubt, image. You know, Biggie's first album, okay, Little Kid with the Afro. You know what I mean? Like, I wanted those images to be mine you know like so i wanted to attach to the music and the rates were better as well you know what i mean like working for an album package like you're shooting seven eight nine shots like whatever you can get with these artists because they need it for press they need it for magazine articles that they don't want to spend the time shooting with some you know some other photographer from berlin or you know what i mean like whatever it is they just you know send a picture it's cool give them an exclusive so like i was shooting a massive you know, 120 rolls of film in, in a day, 10 rolls per, 10 frames per roll. I mean, we were grinding. Going into Reasonable Doubt, uh, how did, um, how did that connection first happen that you were going to get the, mm -hmm. the call? Because uh, like, I guess at this point you wanted, you wanted to do album covers. Mm -hmm. How did that transition happen to where you got your first opportunity? Who made the call from the label and yeah. what's the X's and O's of making that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I had shot Jay for a stress magazine um, and it was just like down by his office and we just had a good vibe. You know, I, I don't know whether it's like a Sagittarian thing, but he's born December 4th, I'm born December 3rd. So I sort of like, it's, it's hard for me to <laughs> say this and people be like, dog, you don't know how he thinks, but I sort of know how he thinks. Like, I don't know, I've seen similarities and like, I mean, he's brilliant. He doesn't say a lot when he says something that's meaningful, like, you know, super clever, very present in every moment. You know, I, I really, I was so impressed by him. I was like, yo, I'm getting this album cover, you know? I'm going to figure out how to do that. I didn't really know he had an album coming when I shot the stress thing. But um, my friend uh, took a job as in the press department at Rockefeller Records. Her name is KB Payne. And uh, she said, look, he's got an album coming. Dame is about the cash. Biggs is a silent sort of investor. He's the engine and Jay's the talent. Like, act accordingly, bring your book bring it this afternoon and I'm going to get you a meeting and I'm going to get you this cover. You know, like, you know, you got to sell yourself, but I'll, I'll put you in the room, you know? And, and did Jay have a, 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 some songs or some, a body of work that you were really I only heard time? Dead Presidents. Wow. I heard the two versions of Dead Presidents. That okay. was on like a casino. <laughs> Which uh, I was like, oh my God, this is out of here. Classic. Like, out of here, gone. Like, I knew him, I knew of him because I was a big Jazz O fan, right? And so, like, I did college radio, as I mentioned sort of earlier. And so, like, I was really knowledgeable about the music, the depth of it, where it was recorded. I was the kid that was reading all the credits. And I think that Jay, in this moment, recognized a number of things. One, my knowledge of, of, of music, of hip-hop, you know? Um, two, that I had ideas that were different than he'd been approached with in the past. You know, because I was bringing reference books, you know, like there's a book called Evidence by Luke Sante and it was old police photos from like 
taken between 19, like 13 and 1918 or something like that, you know, and it was all these like people rolled up in rugs and stuff. But like you look at the scene around and you're seeing this moment in time that was definitely New York and style and trench coats and scarves and hats and like, you know, is phenomenal. So the fact that I was able to bring references, put him in a mindset, paint the picture, tell him how it became his, you know, was was what separated me because I think that there was an understanding that he might take the same route that Biggie had taken with, you know, the Versace, you know, sort of like flowy linen shirts and the, you know, the Versace Miami drug running kind of thing. I was like, no, man, it's Brooklyn. Like plant your feet. Like yeah. it's John Gotti. It's surveillance. It's mob stuff. Like, you know, I painted this bigger picture. We didn't get to do it all, but, but what we did do really sold that story. And paint paint a picture for me what it was like if I were in the room uh, during that shoot. Like, what was going on during that shoot? What oh, stood out shoot? of your mind as far as like a a, a story? What, what was the what day was it? <laughs> paint that picture for me. So I I believe so when I originally walked into 19 John Street for uh, the meeting at Rockefeller Records downtown. It's down by like Fulton Street, down by the city hall. Basically, is where their offices were. Um, you know, humble office, a lot of energy, a lot of young, you know, probably a little sloppy, a little, you know what I mean? Like just, you know, it, it was rugged, man. <laughs> like there was no big business polish kind of stuff going on. It was really, yeah, it was rough and rugged, rough around the edges, man, you know? And uh, I went in and uh, and sold Jay on the idea and, and he was super cool, man. You know, just, yeah, you know, that feels good, feels great, where we need to be, cool. Originally, the album was called Heir to the Throne, and he felt like that was presumptuous. He was like, no, I don't, I don't want it. I want the people to decide whether I'm the actual champ or not. I'm not going to tell you that I am. You're going to know it because the music is going to be there to, to make you understand where I'm coming from, you know? Um, you know, Dame was sort of just, a, again, about the cash. He's like, how much are you going to charge me? It's <laughs> like... 300 less than your lowest bid. He's like, dog, what, what, what does that even mean to me, man? You know, I was like, it means I'm hungry and I want to do this. Pay for the expenses. Give me the little 13-piece chicken that it turned out to be. And like, let me rock. Let's go. Here's what we're doing. And he was like, this was, a, I think, a Thursday maybe that I had that meeting. Um, no, it was Wednesday was the first meeting. And then Jay called me in the next day and he was like, I'm changing the cover. So like I had a whole different concept that I like literally drew out you know, of for heir to the throne, you know, and then I changed it, you know, to reasonable doubt. And that's when we went with the surveillance and mob kind of stuff, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so in the room, this is I think we that meeting was a Thursday and they're like, yeah, but we got to shoot it on Saturday. I was like, all right, cool. And then panicked when I left the office. I was like, yeah, man, got this easy. You know, we shot it on the roof of my building, 72nd and Riverside. There was an open solarium it was just dusty as hell. Um, my assistant was my ex-girlfriend at the time, uh, who also went to Kenya and she was a couple years back. She was doing some sort of internship. She's like, I'll just come carry your light meter or something, you know, like, and just rocked and took a couple of little behind the scenes pictures, which is really awesome to have that now. Like iconic um, pictures. Oh, it's so dope, man. <laughs> just like me shooting Jay with like a fanny pack on, like, <laughs> you know, like it's so dope. It's so dope. <laughs> it had to be nice to be your ex. Your ex got stories. Oh, she got man all that like memories, stories. like iconic memories. And like You're welcome, exes. <laughs> You're welcome, all of you. <laughs> like, honey, yeah, come through. Some this, of you uh... more trifling than others, <laughs> but you're welcome. Yeah, ultimately. honey, come through. I'm shooting this guy named Jay Z. Yeah, yeah, man. If you're free, come through. Take some pictures. No, it was exciting, man. Like I was shooting, you know, Cash Money in New Orleans, and you know, my my girl at the time was living in L.A. I was like, yeah, you want to come to New Orleans? Like I just, yeah, they were budgets. You know what I mean? I was like. Yeah, I could, I could lose a flight. Call you an assistant. <laughs> easy you know, breezy. Little 450 flight, easy, <laughs> little coach action. Like, yo, come on, bring it. Because also, too, uh, what was the amount of time once the shoot wrapped to the album came out? Oh, probably. So I designed the album package with this kid named Adrian Vargas. And, uh, man, just like dope kid, man. We just put it all together. You know, I sort of suggested the shots to use and he assembled it and we liked it and agreed. And, you know, it was really it was phenomenal, man. Uh, and it came together really quickly. And, and I think that we, we nailed it. We chose wisely. And uh, for me, I think the most incredible thing was 
really seeing the images up on the streets. You know, like as you would walk along on 14th Street, you know, by, you know, whatever the uh, Virgin Megastore was there. I, I don't even remember, like whatever, Tower Records, wherever like we were exploring, you know, down the village, like that stroll up and down Broadway was it, you know? 8th Street, St. Mark, like that's where we moved. That's, that's it. And, and all along that lineup was like, Jay, reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt, you know? And I just walk by and I just like paddle, like just to get energy from him. Like, yo, I'm on these walls. Like, I've, it validated me in my mind. Like, I can do this too. Uh, how did that, uh, that album cover change your life from then on forward? It gave the record labels an example that I could create an entire package. You know, like it wasn't just like one page in a magazine. Like, oh, that looks dope. Oh, Jonathan Manny, cool. You know what I mean? Like, oh, he can shoot. Oh, that's a nice picture of said person, whoever it is, you know? I think it was like I can conceptualize and deliver an entire thought, you know? I can, beginning, middle, and end, you know? I can deliver something that they can sink their teeth into. And, and I think that was it. I think that was, from there, it led to a relationship with Def Jam, which was, you know, man, over a decade long. I mean, it's still, it's, still ongoing you know but you know there was a real sweet spot it was ja rule it was dmx it was jay you know it was everything that was happening Ludacris when he dropped like i was just doing everything because i just delivered i delivered i did it calmly i did it you know again like not being able to look at the images in the back i just knew what i was coming up with and i would chase and art directors would just love me because i would turn in everything that they needed tenfold you know so so that was it you know it was and then it was like okay who did jay okay let's get him to do dmx who did jay and dmx oh it's the same kid okay get that kid like you know and then we'd meet a manager like hey we got this kid named nelly out of st louis you interested in going to st louis like yeah come on midwest let's go let's rock you, you did cover. nelly cover too yeah i've done Dude, you're like almost all of them i've probably you know the <laughs> This is the, the shameless plug. I've probably done over 300 album covers for hip hop. And probably half of them are relatively important. You know? Wow. Eight, eight Jay Z albums, four for yep. Rick Ross, four for the game. It's, it's understanding that I'm gonna give everything that I have in any given moment to make you win. You know, like, not, like <laughs> it's funny, it's like uh, I'm always number two on my set. You know, I'm number one for making the thing happen, but like it's always the artist that you have to like without the artist there, yeah, we're all just sitting around. You know what I mean? Like waiting and prepping and shooting. It's like when when the artist arrives, it's go time. That's why it's like, yo, number one's on set. You know, it's like that's it. That's the purpose. We are here to elevate and hold that person high that day. That is my job. And if they're not happy, then I'm not doing my job. It still is like a service industry. You know, in, in a lot of ways, like, you know, obviously photographers, a lot of them have a big chip on their shoulders. Like, certainly I know that I do what I do well, you know, and for friends and family, like, I'm going to give you the real story. But, you know, apart from that, like, you, you're going to always catch me humble because, like, things change so quickly. So for me to be grateful for what I'm doing, grateful to be still exploring the contents of my mind and delivering important work and for people to continue to trust me, you know, it's like from major keys, cool, we got grateful now. Cause yo, we, we sent the thing to outer space. Yep. Like the business now is harder because the labels don't you know, have the abundance that they once had. And if they do have it, they're hiding it and want to keep it. <laughs> you know? right, like, right. So it's not going in some of the places that it, it has gone in the past. But you, were, you, you had a long career where there was film and yeah. now we've moved on to digital. How did that transition happen for you and what impact has it had on your work if at all yeah i mean it really comes down to your eye you know what i mean like when all is said and done if you can see you can shoot you know if you can really do it obviously the technical thing things have changed a little bit you know i think it becomes easier now in some ways because we're just you know we're traveling with one camera with the back and a hard drive you know like it it definitely cut down on excess baggage you know what I mean which we are paying thousands thousands and thousands a year to carry our own stuff and multiple cameras like you know to to compare and contrast it's like one camera that I rent wherever I go versus 
traveling with probably about 15 cameras at every, you know, at any, even a simple shoot was probably 10 cameras, you know? It's like the workhorse Pentax 67, three Polaroids in case one went down, a specialty like Fuji Panoramic 617, you know, like I was a film guy. I loved it. I loved the way that the different formats changed how I saw the environment. You know, like looking through a different thing, you're going to see that differently than a, than a really wide, you know. So um, and now I don't know, but I think with digital, I think some of the magic is lost because I think some of what made film beautiful was really that you had to be patient. You couldn't have it right away. I liked having to wait for two days to anticipate the film coming back, to be excited about editing it. I really loved going through the film and boxing it up and spending time thinking about it, offering doodles of layouts like, you know, I was in it. It was a it was a richer, more connected process to me. I, I kind of think of it like uh, like wine. Mm -hmm. Now everyone's going with like the twist. Uh, obviously, you're a wine guy with one hundred and fifty dollars screw top. <laughs> right. Screw top wine. Now, I understand the practicality of having this, yeah. this screw top wine. But there's nah, something about having the present. Right. Something process, about. about the presentation, yep. have it given to you at the table. Just imagine going to. How are you getting that cork out? Is it you know? Do you get it? Did you get a wine key? You know, when you were in Paris, that has your name engraved in the blade from, you know, like yes, yeah, I, I have that. <laughs> and the and, and, and there, there's that. a magic with opening that wine. Yep. Yeah. You know, so so now you go to a restaurant. I have a fifty dollars steak. I sit down. I'm at Luger's. Mm -hmm. The waiter brings me the wine and. <laughs> Like, it just sounds like a Coke. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like opening a 40 ounce yeah. of St. Ives. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jonathan Mannion, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. You are the man. Thank you. Oh, man, I appreciate it. Forever grateful. Oh, you're welcome. Anytime. Anytime.